And then, yeah. So the, the, one, the one thing I was kind of expecting today was that you guys would have access to Grasshopper. Um, it seems like you don't. So uh, has everyone actually opened Grasshopper yet, ever, in Rhino? Right, so Grasshopper is a plugin for Rhino. Uh, so everyone here has been playing with Rhino. I can see Rhino screens up. That means you, you're expecting me to talk about it at least. Um, so uh, for those of you who haven't even tried to get access to Grasshopper, you won't be able to install it today. I've already tried. Um, it doesn't work. Um, so unfortunately, I'm just going to talk you guys through things and you just you won't be able to follow along in terms of scripting um, but hopefully in terms of me recording you will be able to follow along with a laptop later um, or I believe Nina's we're trying to do it through corroborate so. but, but the, uh, Nina, Nina and I will organize for these computers to eventually have grasshopper it shouldn't take very long for IT um, to install it. How many of you have uh, Grasshopper at home? <clears throat> is it free? Yeah. Yes, it's free. So you can get Grasshopper at grasshopper3d.com. Um, you'll find it under a get, the get button uh, on that uh, web page. And they require you to put in your email address, but you can put whatever you want in and it'll give you access to download it to, yeah? No, Rhino is not free. You do, yeah. You do. You will need Rhino. So, as a student, you should be able to get Rhino for uh, a lot less than a, a like a commercial license. It's about two to three hundred dollars. Um, I believe all of you have access to IDDA. That means you should be able to get a discount through IDDA even on that. I think they'll take fifty dollars off. So, gra Grasshopper is free. So once you get Rhino, you can get Grasshopper. There's a new Rhino coming out in the near future, Rhino 6. And with that, uh, Grasshopper comes with it. So you don't even have to install it. Just, um, just to, yes? Rhino just for No, so Rhino is also for Mac. And you can also get a fairly uh, basic version of Grasshopper for Mac. Um, so it, is, it isn't as stable. Um, and usually I'll, I'll see students go for a boot camp version of, of this instead of running, uh, running the, Rhino, uh, the Mac version. Half the reason why uh, the new Rhino is taking so long is that they are actually making it to be stable and the same on both Mac and Windows. So uh, those Mac users out there, you can look forward to that. I, I don't know when it's going to come out. So what do we have done? So can you just see how they can um, you can corroborate? Um, you can either follow here or you can follow this page. But I think he can. Yeah. So what? What's the link? Do you want to yeah, write it's it up? Yeah, automatically set up on yours. So I've just got it running down there. But if they um, what what link do they need to go to? Uh, do they know? No. Okay. <laughs> Oh, okay, cool. So, uh, just a few little uh, housekeeping things with Grasshopper. There are various ways to use Grasshopper, and I, I like to use Grasshopper in a way that is good to for people that is learning. So, uh, there are various ways to look at it. Um, as you can see here, we've got. I'll just maximize it. As you can see, we have a canvas. This is where all the code actually goes. We have a ribbon at the top. That's where uh, you can grab components and functions for that code. Um, and a lot of people, they end up uh, installing Grasshopper looking like this. So when they've set it up, it will... It'll look like this. So um, all the components will be displaying some form of text that describes what they are. 
Um, I personally don't like this way of looking at Grasshopper. I believe neither does Ben Curry, who's the one, who's, he's the guy talking to you in IDDA. Um, so I like to use the icons purely because I'm visual. Hopefully all of you guys are quite visual type, types of people as well as architects. So before you, um, before you even get started with a script, just make sure you go up to display and make sure draw icons is on. Is this quite hard to see? I find it's very small. Is it, I can change the resolution of the screen if that helps. Pardon? Yeah. Okay, um, Nick has just sent you an email with a corroborate link, which you should be able to open then on your screen. Then you can follow up what he's saying. I don't think that you say. So it's it's useful me making this uh, lower res. Yeah. Uh, so you can change the you can change this to display icons through display draw icons as well. I find uh, moving through the ribbon is actually quite a useful uh, way of learning Grasshopper because basically everything that you have available to you to to use will be in that ribbon. So a lot of people they will use Grasshopper by double clicking and they'll type in the uh, command that they want. So for example, if I want to create a line, I'll type line in, but really that limits you to what you, you know. And if you go through the ribbon, it's quite an explorative process. So the ribbon is broken down into uh, very simple categories uh, from parameters, maths, sets, vector, curve, surface, mesh, intersect, transform, and display. Okay, so if you have, if you want to do something in Grasshopper and you have no idea what's available, let's say you want to do something with surfaces, then you're where, what's the most likely tab that you're going to find that under? Anyone? I ask really simple questions. I, softballs. Where? Surface. surface, yes. So, uh, under surface, uh, yet again, they've uh, recategorized everything into and it's, it's probably very hard to read this, but this guy here is called analysis. We've got freeform, primitive, and utilities. So utilities will have stuff like dividing something up or getting information out of it, what, and so will analysis. So for example, if I want the area of a surface, the surface area, which section do you have a rough idea of where that would be? Remember I had Analysis, freeform, primitive, and utilities. Anyone? You, you can guess wrong. I won't. Is that, I'm not, analysis? Exactly. Right? So it's very intuitive. So, someone has not gone out of their way to make this difficult to use. They've tried to make it easy, uh, as easy as it can be. The key thing here is, I've got a very small set section of components up to in the ribbon. Just note that most of these sections have drop downs where there are more components. So please go exploring in them. If you've got a big screen and you've grasshoppers quite wide, you note that this isn't filling my screen. It's only taking up maybe like even one fifth. If you select view obscure components, it'll try and put all the components in the ribbon out to 100%. Is everyone cool with that? Okay, so even though you do have the capability of double clicking and typing in a component, as you're learning, try and use the ribbon and go exploring, see what stuff does, okay? Because IDDA doesn't cover everything. It only covers a small window of what's here. Um, so just be mindful of that. Now. Nina's explained to me uh, that you guys have been asked to collect data. 
uh, and that could relate to sound or texture or, or basically anything in an urban environment. So like if I just pick someone randomly like you, what type of data did, did you grab? Okay, great. So that's like something that's quantifiable, right? If all of you were out there grabbing something quantifiable, that means it has a number associated to it. Was anyone grabbing anything qualitative? So it's almost like you make the judgment of this is a nice space. This is a, um, yeah? So what would you have grabbed that was qualitative? Um, when I feel Right, but you were able to still assign like a value to that. Yeah, sort of. Yeah. Sort of. So there's a scale and there might be multiple scales. So like I understand that safety might not be a polar relationship. Maybe it's just when I was uncomfortable. Right. Just one, there so true or false? Yeah. Okay. So what, what I'm going to do today is show you guys some ways that I can use Grasshopper to take uh, abstract information such as grabbing information like tweet likes or whether or not you're uncomfortable in a space or not and associate that in CAD space and have that abstract in parametric uh, code okay and the simplest form I can think of that's quite interesting is a system called attractors is there anyone familiar with like hearing that within computational design or not no? Okay, so I'm going to do a little exercise. I want you all to imagine that you are points in space. So just imagine like somewhere, wherever you identify as the center of you, that's a point, and it has a distance to me. And what we're going to do is we're going to abstract the distance between you and me to you putting your arm up and down. So as I get closer to you, I want you to stick your arm up higher, and as I get further away, I want you to put your arm down. And the limit of that will be, let's say, two to four meters, just, just to be, so not everyone's sticking their arm up, okay? So as an, eight, as an attractor agent, as I move around, I would hope that people start sticking their arm up, because what you're doing is you're identifying how far I am away from you, and everyone should be able to see that each of these particular points in space, I call you guys points, but you're people, um, you guys are actually identifying how far you are. Is this guy part of the class? Okay. <laughs> and, and you're responding. Now, the thing is, I'm actually quite close to you guys, right? Yeah. So just remember, you're still in the system. So all we're doing, you can stop now. Okay. All we're doing is we're abstracting distance, proximity, to sticking our arm up and down. Okay? So I like to call the people that are here sticking their arm up and down monads. Monads are very simple things. They, they have a simple function, but they have variables in them. So all of you are looking at very simple monads right now as you look at your screens. You can think of pixels as monads. All a pixel is is a tiny little square that can be, uh, it can change its red, green, and blue value. But in a system, if you would imagine a square, you can just make it a different color, it's quite boring, right? But if you have a million of them in a system, you can make images, okay? So the variable that we change on a pixel is it's red, green, blue. The variable that I changed on you guys, asked you to change, was sticking your arm up and down, okay? So just think, when if you were to take, for example, the Facebook likes or Twitter likes in various spaces, what could you do to the variables of space to, to respond to that? So if it was a freeform canopy, could you have undulating uh, forms? And as things are more comfortable, they open up. And as they become more uncomfortable, they close down. They get lower. Could you play with something's color? Could you uh, say, as we move into a place that's very vibrant in uh, Twitter likes, it's red, but as we move away, it goes dark, it goes blue, let's say. So that, that's kind of where you guys need to approach coding before you even start writing the code, okay? You need to know what are the variables and how do we control them and what are we abstracting, cool?
Okay, so I'm going to write an attractor script. Normally, I would have you guys follow along. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pretend that you are, so that when you're watching the video later, it's running at the pace that you are following along. Okay? Okay, so Grasshopper, it's a left-to-right coding base, and it's a dreamscape of Rhino. Um, I, I just I have to remember that you guys haven't actually used it, so I just got to introduce you a few more things. So uh, I like to think of it very much like a person making a cake or a person dreaming. Okay, when you make a cake, you grab ingredients, you put it in a bowl, and you end up with this very dynamic, fluid thing. You can do things to it, you can change it, you can change its shape, you can throw more ingredients in, um, and it's. It's, done, it's completely dynamic as you work with it. Unfortunately, cakes aren't magic enough to pull things out. But in Grasshopper, you can throw something in, try it out. If you don't like it, pull it out. It exists where it's, it's quite dynamic. Rhino is very much like the, the table where all the food's been, been prepared. And it's, it's quite static. So if you've made a Rhino, everyone's played with Rhino at least. Yeah? So you, you no? Okay, have you used any CAD software? Okay, so it's quite, it's quite analog in its process. If you want to draw a line, you have to manually go in and draw the line that you want. And if you want to change that line, you have to go and select that line and effectively do the job again, right? So Grasshopper, all grasshopper geometry sits outside of that space. It sits in a dreamscape or, a, um, or that dynamic environment. So if you draw something in grasshopper, it will be displayed in Rhino, but it will, you cannot select it. So I'll, just, I'll show you for an example. I'm going to draw a sphere. So uh, this is Rhino, left is Rhino, right is Grasshopper, okay? So I'll just quickly draw a sphere, um, and you'll note that this, this sphere here, it's green. When I deselect it in Grasshopper, it's red, but in Rhino, it's completely unselectable. I can't do anything to it, right? So if you want to bring stuff from uh, the real world into your dreamscape, you have to use a few components. And I'll, I'll you do that now. So we've got points. I'll draw some points in Rhino. And obviously, we, we don't see any representation of them in Grasshopper yet. And this is why we have parameters. So I go to the parameter tab and grab points. So this is now a component that represents points. It's orange because it's empty. So just, you'll, you'll get used to seeing the color codes. Orange means empty in Grasshopper. And if I want to bring information into Grasshopper, I right click that parameter. I select either set one point or set multiple points. And that then gives me the ability to select those points, hit enter, and you can now see those points are represented as little black, uh, sorry, red crosses. So that now means that it exists in Grasshopper's world. But if I do something to these points, such as move them, so you can see here I've got the points that uh, we originally brought in and the points that have been moved. I can't, I can't select those points. So this, this point in Rhino is still selectable and movable. And the process that we, we did to that point has happened, so it's been moved. But the moved point, it's not in Rhino anymore. It's actually in that dream dynamic space. Cool? Does that make sense? No? It doesn't make sense? So, so this point here, that if I hide, if I hide what we, we brought in, you can see there's the Rhino point. And there's the grasshopper point. And this, this component here, hang on, I'll just, uh, this might make it a bit easier. This component is a, it's a script, it's a process, an algorithm. So it's almost like if I were to 
uh, the, this particular thing moves things, and the instruction I gave it is to move it up, right? So it's taking the point, it's moving it up. So what we're seeing is the grasshopper point that's been moved up, but it's not in Rhino. It's only in Grasshopper. This is probably one of the mo mo most like metaphorical things people need to get their head around. Once you get this, you're, you're easy, right? It's all good. So the key thing is, we want this to get back into Rhino, right? Like it doesn't help this thing being in dream space because if I close Grasshopper now, it, it disappears, yeah? It's almost like I've woken up. It's gone. So, to get things back from Grasshopper into Rhino, we have to make them static, because Rhino can't handle anything but static information. So, uh, fortunately, uh, I've chosen the metaphor of the cake. So, when you take a dynamic liquid cake, what do you do to that to, to make it static? You bake it. Brilliant. Cooking it. My dad's a baker. Cooking bread and bake cooking bread and cooking cakes means burning it. Yep. So we bake, we bake dynamic liquid cakes and they become solid and static. And you can't, once you've made something static and baked, you can't undo baking a cake, right? You can't make it a liquid again. So once I bake this we can actually see that we've received those points now in, in Grasshopper. Now, I'll, I'll just show you the bake symbol is this little egg, the, the uh, egg yolk. Um, I don't know why it's an egg, it really should be bread, whatever. Because um, you fry eggs, not bake them. Um, mind you, this was written by someone who doesn't speak, well, English is their second language, so maybe in a... Uh, Icelandic bake and uh, fry is the same thing. The key thing here is I've opened up a little radial menu. You can access the radial menu in Grasshopper by hitting spacebar or using the middle click button on your mouse. Cool. So this guy here, bake, that puts stuff back into Rhino. We good? Sweet. So the key thing is if I move this point now, the, we, we've got the grasshopper point there, but you can see this point, that was the one that we baked. So it's still there. It's not actually responding to that algorithm that we, we made it do. Is that, is that all baking in? It's all setting in? What does it, sorry, what does it look like when it's baked in grasshopper? Uh, when you bake things in grasshopper, grasshopper doesn't do anything other than push the geometry into Rhino. Okay, so you can only really Yes, so anything baked is now in Rhino. You can hide, you can hide the geometry in uh, Grasshopper. So that's why you'll note, I've taken these points and I've moved them, but I can actually look throughout the whole history of this script. So I can look at the points before they were moved, and I can look at the points after they were moved. And I can use both those points in a system. So, uh, and I do that by hitting the space bar and you can preview and hide geometry and components in Grasshopper with the blindfolded man and the unblindfolded man. Cool? So if I, if I hide the, this move, but I bake it, you'll note that point appearing. Maybe what would be a better example, because points are hard to see, is if I um, put a sphere in. We we'll use that sphere example. So you can see we've got that green or red sphere, and if I hide it and bake it, it appears in as Rhino geometry. Uh, I've, I've got this set to wireframe, so in shaded mode, the, the sphere will appear. Cool? Okay, now let's do, some, do something fun instead of just explaining these concepts. Just know, you, it's worth knowing those concepts as I do this, okay? So, half the stuff that I'm going to do is going to be in Grasshopper, and half the stuff I'm going to do is in Rhino. The stuff that I do in Rhino is kind of the way that you guys will input information in, so that abstraction that you've collected, 
you would pull that in, you would draw it in Rhino, because you're all really good at drawing in, in CAD software, right? Or at least capable. And then you can, you can actually pull that in. A lot of people who are learning Grasshopper, they say, I want to do everything in Grasshopper. Everything. Just, and it's capable of doing it. It's just going and drawing a point in a space is quite intuitive versus actually working out exactly what coordinate that is, typing that in. It's not, it's not so intuitive. So I want you guys to just remember, use, use the things as, as you need to. If you want to draw a line, draw it in Rhino. Don't, you don't have to draw it in Grasshopper. If you want to draw a line that's dynamic, that moves as you, as you play with sliders, then use Grasshopper. Cool? OK. So I'm going to work in meters, just because I don't want to type you know, lots of zeros, because you guys are doing urban space, right? Geez, it's already been 40 minutes. Is it? Is that correct? Geez, it's taken a while. Okay, I've got to speed up. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to set down some uh, a grid of points. I'm going to do that. Points are, are you can find them in vector, and we've got this nice component here that puts down a square grid for us. Um, and I'm going to use sliders to control how many points I I have. So I'm going to throw a slider in. I'm going to double click it to grab the, the variables that define that. So sliders obviously have to go from a minimum to a maximum. So I'm going to put in maybe 50 points uh, at an integer. Uh, so that's the number in the x direction. So you can see as I play with this slider, it's actually the, the Rhino or the, the display is showing the number changing. So it's a variable, it's dynamic. Um, and I'm going to copy and paste that same slider and put that into Y. So that's giving me a square grid. I can use the same slider, uh, the same slider in both those variables. So as I play with that number, it's affecting both. Yeah? So you, things can share variables. So you can connect things and and... So as, as you were sticking your arm up, I could have also had you stick your arm out, your right arm out, and that's technically sharing that variable of the, the proximity between you and me. Yeah? Cool? Okay. So from this, I get points. And these points are going to act in a very similar way to how uh, you, were, you were points in the system where you stuck your arm up. Okay? And the point, the agent that I, I, I was, I was the person moving around, making you stick your arm up. I'm going to draw those points in Grasshopper, uh, in Rhino, sorry. And the thing is, if I had asked Nina to also participate in that walk around exercise, you guys would have had to have paid attention to both me and Nina. And as we get close, your arm would have stuck up. Yeah? So... Having one person move around, it ends up with, we might get like a blob, and just that blob moves around. But being able to put two blobs in, you get the ability to start sculpting. Okay? Sculpting with your data. So I'm going to draw two points. Uh, shall we go three? Three points? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I've got, a pr I've got approval. <laughs> uh, and the key thing here is I need to pull those points into Grasshopper, and I showed you that before, so I'm going to select those three points, and they are now displayed there. So, what we need to do, and uh, I'm, there's going to be some fairly complex things in here, and it usually takes me about four hours to teach my students what these things are. So, whenever I say, just use this, but I'm not going to explain it, it's quite complicated, just use it, okay? It's, going to, it's too complicated for me to describe. So what I'm going to do is flatten our data and just ignore how, what actually flatten does. I'm going to put a little purple zone around it so that you know to ignore it. And then what I'm going to do is find the distance between our points and uh, our uh, agent points and our grid. 
So what that's going to give us is a big fat list of numbers. Um, and I'm also going to graph this. This is yet another uh, ignore what this does system. So flatten tree and graph tree? Yes. Just one sec. Very simple explanation. What do they do? <laughs> okay, um, so if you imagine, uh, if you were to take a grid of numbers, let's say an Excel grid, and we look at the columns, we can think of each column as a list, right? Um, and you can see here, I've got a list of numbers here. What Grasshopper does is it can only present things as a list. So instead of showing you the first column and then the second column and the third column, it just shows you each column in a, in a big list divided up by what, I, what we call branches. So what flatten tree does is it removes all branches and it treats the whole list as a single list, while graft, what it does is it takes each item in a list and it makes it its own new list, like as if they were in, an, in their own column. It, you can understand why this gets complicated yeah, so because... I, I think that's good, I, I think that's really good. So basically, Flatten the tree is you made it linear. The graph tree is you've taken one tree and da, 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 you plant you it. plant new branches yeah. for, per tree. So tree trees, understanding trees and understanding data, it's kind of the the milestone of whether or not you're a beginner grasshopper user or an, an intermediate. Once you start understanding where to use flatten, and where to use graph, you become intermediate. When you start learning how to literally create the most complicated trees and store data in them and make buildings using that data, that's when you sort of get into the advanced side of things. Uh, if I showed you some of that stuff, it's, it would, it's okay. it would scare you. <laughs> yep, okay. So what this is actually doing is it's giving me three branches. Each branch or, or list is actually a distance to each point, right? So we're measuring all these points here to, to this, this point, and then we're measuring the distance between all these points and that point, and then all these points and this point, right? So if I were to get Nina and I to walk around, and I just tell you which choose, you have to choose who's closest and define that person as who, who whether you move your arm up and down, um, then you need, to, you need to do a process of working out who's closest, right? Now Grasshopper, in no way is it the smartest thing in the world. And we don't have software that is smart. We're, we're smart. We, we have to instruct these things what to do. And they're super dumb. They are so dumb. If you, whatever you tell them to do, they'll do it. And I'm sure everyone here has had problems with computers where you, you, haven't, you don't know actually how to tell the computer what to do. And it just keeps screwing up, right? So. Imagine this thing is like a very, very small child who's capable of doing a thousand things a second. It's very powerful. It just needs the right instruction, okay? So what we need to do, yet again, this is another thing that I can't explain in the time that we have, but I need to flip the matrix. So it's literally like taking Neo and putting him on his side. Um, so it makes columns, rows, and rows, columns. Okay, it only works on two-dimensional matrices for those of you who understand maths. Um, so if you've got a three-dimensional one, it won't work because you don't know which way to flip it. The key thing is, instead of us getting a big list of numbers like this, we get three numbers per point and their relationship to their surrounding points. Okay, so what I need to do is I need to work out which one of those is the smallest number. And the process of doing that is, is quite simple. We just need to sort them. So we're actually just creating, imagine you, you would, I would ask you to do this manually. Uh, and I would just say, just measure the distance between all of those points. And I want you to give me the shortest number. You would manually go through, you'd measure all the distances and then you'd work out which one's the lowest. So which one of the, on the first list is the lowest? One. Yes, and then if I, could I get you to order them? Like you would be able to go through and put them in order ascending, right? So we have the sort list function, which effectively 
takes each list and sorts them from lowest to highest. So that, that's going to help us find whichever the lowest one is. Maybe you guys are interested in which one's the highest, right? Sort list will do that for you. The key thing is we're going to pick an item out of each list and that's going to tell us uh, which distance to use to work out whether or not they stick up, okay? So I've got, I've sorted this and what I'm going to do is grab the first item of that list. So the first item is always zero and the second item is always one. I know this is really counterintuitive, it's just something that he, uh, the Arabs and the Indians invented. They invented zero and it's very useful. So the key thing is zero is the first item in most computer science packages. Um, in these lists, which item is the last item? Just really simple question, softballing it, two? Two? Now, if you think of these lists as a, something that you can actually loop around, is that me? No, that's, right. that's okay. If, if you think of these lists as something you can loop around, if I wanted to get to the last item and I had to manually type that in, I'd have to type in two. But if I put in four points, five points, six points, as in this system, I would have to work out how many points there are and type that in, yeah? So fortunately, lists can be understood not in a linear format, but in a circular format. So item two can also be understood as item minus one. Cool? So the last item is always minus one, and the first item is always zero. Cool? So we'll grab the first item. I'm going to grab a panel, and I'm just going to type in zero into that. And that's going to give us the, the distance to the closest point. Now, just bef before we start playing with this thing, I'm going to show you what this does. We're going to turn this into a Z vector. Vectors are an object that describes direction and distance. Okay? So I can describe my velocity as I move in a car as a vector. I'm going in that direction at a certain speed. Or we could just basically define uh, grabbing an item and moving it into another point by a vector. So we're going to use the Z vector, Z being the uh, Cartesian coordinates, X, Y, and Z. We're going to use the Z vector. We're going to control the Z vector with our list item. I'm going to flatten this because, and uh, yet again, Please ignore what this does, but just use it. And we are going to move our points. Why am I using the TV? We're going to move our points that have been flattened using those distances. Cool? So you'll note that the further the point gets away, the more it goes up. Is this... Is this you don't understand, like, this is impressive? Yes, it's cool. What, what was the step in between that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, all I did was, all I did was, I, so I took my list of points and I moved them. And I, what I did is I used the proximity distance that we picked out to define how far they move. Cool? How, like, how high they move up. Pardon? It's the hand. It's the hand. Yes, exactly. But the key thing is, this point here is the furthest point from any other point. And what we're actually using is we're using the, the shortest distance it has to any of those points to define how high it goes. So it was actually as if I were to walk around and say, if I'm really far away from you, whatever the distance you are from me, stick your hand up that high. Right? That's what we're saying to this system right now. So we can do stuff to these numbers, we can abstract them, we can control them how we, however we want to invert that. So I could take the distance and, and invert it so as I'm getting closer it gets higher. And so before I do that, just note this is made of points, right? It's little points in space. Unfortunately in life we can't actually you know, make points. They're so infinitely small, they don't exist. So we need to start turning this into geometry that 
at least architects can deal with. Um, so I'm going to turn these guys into lines or curves, and then I'm going to create a loft out of them. Everyone, f most people familiar with curves and lofting? No, not familiar with lofting? Okay, all lofting is, is it's taking a curve, another curve, and another curve in sequence, and it's trying to create a mathematical uh, surface between them. I'll, let me demonstrate. It's probably easy to see if I, if I demonstrate it. So yet again, I'm going to put in another purple component. Please ignore what this, mean, what this is. It's effectively the opposite of flattened tree. So it's taking this structure of our original grid. It's taking our flat tree and it's unflattening it. That then gives me the ability to draw an interpolated curve among those lines. So if I hide everything now and just show that curve, that's, that's the surface that, well, that's, that's eventually going to become a surface. And what loft does is it generates a surface between those, those curves. Cool? Sweet. So, really cool thing, because this is the pro, like we've written that process, it doesn't matter where those points are, the process is still going to work. So, wherever the points exist in our script, if I change these points, the script is going to go back to that point and step through those, those steps uh, until it's finished. So, if I move this point here, inwards, then we, we have the ability to change it quite quickly. So we get a lot of complexity very fast. Cool? Okay. So... Can I just ask you something? Sh sure. So does it remember the process of you moving something up and down? What do you mean? Like you moved that point. This point? It was somewhere before. Yes. Does it remember? No. It? Well, okay, it, you can undo it in Rhino. But it's not, it's not like a, you, it's not saving it. Yeah. You can save it. You yeah. can save different states. What, what you could do is you could actually have groups of points and you can, you can draw the points for one example and then import them into Grasshopper and bake that and then draw the next points and import them in as a replacement and then use those. So you can remember different states. So you won't, you can either undo but it won't give me like five states. If I was here, yeah. the geometry was there. If well, I moved here, the geometry was there. So it has, you have to capture each geometry. I can, yeah. So like, for example, what you're talking about now, I would, I would if I needed to do that as an exercise, mm -hmm. um, this is not liking my um, resolution, but I could create a, um, Let's say I'll, I'll just group these points together. Imagine I'm putting in a new layer. Everyone familiar with layers, at least? Even Archicad? Yep, sweet. Okay, so imagine this is a new layer. Um, I'll select those points. I can bring these points in now and use them instead of the original ones, and that's the outcome of those points. So you can start bringing... And playing you can turn on and off the layers. Yep, you can bring, well obviously like if you want to bring new layers in, you just have to replace them. Another way you could do this is you could store these points in their own point parameter. So these, these are the, let's say this is option one. So you can say stage one, stage two. Yes, yeah, so you could say stage one, so this is stage one, and then this is stage two. Okay. Yeah? yeah? Has everyone got that? Am I going too fast? What's what's really cool is you can put all your effort into the script and all you have to do is play around with the variables and you get you get different results. Yeah? If you have different layers, three different layers, yep. right, with three different points. Yep. Then could you and you've seen them in isolation from one another, can you then combine them all? Combine them into one continuum? Yes. So for example, if I want to if I want to bring these these points together, I can if I hold shift while I join this to the system, it actually merges them and it now uses all those points at once. 
Cool? Okay. We've made uh, little conical dips, but that's definitely not giving you control over the, the form, right? All you can do is cones, yeah? So let's quickly control these numbers as they come out of the system. Is there, are these guys, are you part of the class? You're more than welcome to stay. It's just I'm quite loud and you know, I jump around and stuff. And I might stand over you because I'm like this. Yep. So, okay, just, I'm not doing that on purpose. Cool. Okay, so, maths. I know people don't like the sound of maths. I know it's something that you didn't really expect to be doing in architecture. That's what engineering was for, right? Most, if I said, hey, yeah, maths is fun, most people here don't disagree. Maths is fun. Yeah, maths is fun. No, it's okay, fine. Okay, either way, we for us to be able to start playing with these these uh, the way this geometry works, we have to basically do stuff to those numbers. And the stuff that we do to those numbers, unfortunately, has to be maths. Um, so what I like to do with any number, be it a thousand, like especially when it's in a list, if it's like within thousands of meters or millimeters, uh, through to like millions or just between zero and ten, I like to take those numbers and squeeze them in between zero and one. Because everyone has, they know how to work between zero and one. And all the maths becomes really simple between zero and one. Cool? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take these numbers. So as they come out of this, uh, this system here, I'm going to use uh, a lot of maths functions right now. This function is called remap numbers. It effectively takes a number, works out where it exists linearly between two numbers, and then squishes it to another uh, two numbers. So by default, it takes any number between zero and one, which we can see if we highlight uh, the S, and it maps it to any number between zero and one. So if I plug this in right now, it's literally, it's not going to do anything, okay? Because it's remapping from the same number system to the same number system. What I want to do, you remember how I said, hey, if I'm between two and four meters of you, I want you to stick your arm up. And at two meters, it's up full. And at four meters, it's, it's dropped. And it, anywhere in between you guys were sort of like finding the middle ground. This is how we're going to define that two to four meters, okay? So, I'm going to use a construct domain. I'm going to throw a slider into this system. Let's say 10 meters goes uh, is the maximum number that we can play with. And what we're effectively doing is defining the minimum and maximum of that, that domain. So, for example, 2 and 4 is the example that I used before. Okay, that goes into the, the domain that we're mapping from. And uh, by default, this is zero to one, which is great. That means we don't have to put anything into it. And what you'll note is that if I use the clipped numbers, that we're only ever gonna get a number between zero and one now. So that, that's effectively working out, okay, if it's, if it's 12 meters, then it's past four, so it can only be one. And if it's, if it's one meter away, like me now, um, creepy I know, um, she's using Revit. Okay, um, sorry. <laughs> um, so if I'm one meter away, that's less than two, so that'll be zero. Yeah? So, if I, if I just quickly dump that into our, our uh, input, for the vectors, we, we've now limited the system. So if it's beyond four meters, it does something uh, constant. And if it's below two meters, it does something constant. Yeah? The key reason why I want to move this stuff into uh, you, zero to one is there's this really fun component called graph mapper. And graph mapper really likes to work with numbers between zero and one. What it does is it takes 
a graph type. If you right click it, it'll give you a whole bunch of graphs. I'm just going to use the linear one right now. And it works as the number that goes into it, it will work out where that number sits between 0 and 1 on the x plane, on the x axis. And it will work out where that number sits on the line uh, on the y axis and output that as a y. So for example, this linear graph that we've got here won't change anything. But if I, if I change this now, the number 0 is going to output 1. And the number one is going to output zero. Does, does that make sense, everyone? Yeah, OK. So for example, I'm going to chuck my clipped numbers in there. And the output of that is going to give us the inverse, because it's a like it's, that's what the graph does. It inverts the numbers. So really cool thing about the graph. Can you just, um, the loop thing that you are, is it something to do with the loop? What do you mean? Um, you know, you said when it calculates between 0 and 2, it does it in a loop. Ah, oh, that's lists. Okay. Like, OK, so this has the looping with lists. The thing is, like, if I take this run of people, um, we could think of you as the 0 person, and you're 1 and 2 and 3. I don't really care how long that is. I know that this person over here, hello, you're minus 1. But you could also be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Yeah? The thing is, you can also be considered as minus 8. And if I go to 8, you're also 8. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Yeah? Cool? That's, that's all that means. This is different. This is just moving. doesn't matter how far they are. We're cramming everything into 0 to 1. And the key, the key reason I did that, graph mapper, you can see here the coordinates are 0 to 1. If we choose any other number, it's going to go beyond what the graph wants, and then we're going to have to play around with the graph. So the system that we just did, it, it squishes it so that it fits in the graph. So there are various different graphs in the world. Uh, there are sine waves that allow us to do some pretty cool things with numbers. There are um, Bezier-style curves that allow us to effectively do, change the fall-off rate of, of things. So for example, if I change that to so that it goes high, we can play around with that fall-off so it's not necessarily conical. The key thing is it's only moving this stuff up one meter, right? And it's only ever going to move it up one meter. So all we need to do to play around with the exact height that we want to use now is just remap it, a number from 0 to 1, to however high we want it to go. So we use a remap again. We're going to remap our variables. Now you'll note, remember how I was sort of talking about throwing stuff into the cake and I can take stuff out of the cake? So feel free to get in into a certain part of your script and start changing it because Grasshopper doesn't care. You, you can uh, do stuff after you've made it and it will affect that system as, as what I'm doing here right now. So we're going to change these numbers. We're going to grab yet again another construct domain. We want to change these so that they go from 0 to 1. And let's just use 2 to 4 right now. So. This is almost like making a canopy that's guaranteed to always be two meters high, and then at the parts that there are points, it's going to be four meters. Cool? So if I start, like if I want to make something conical, uh, sorry, spherical, we can start playing around with that, and we get uh, some fairly interesting geometry from that. Obvi like, obviously, there's finessing involved if you want to get something perfect. But this, you, can, you can see that there's a whole bunch of variables there that you can get a wide vari variety of geometries from this thing. So the sine waves, they're always uh, quite popular um, because you can get rather um, chaotic systems. But just remember, we can also control the, the maximum extent of, of our system, and that's then going to help us control control that and that even looks like there's four 
There's four points controlling that. It's just the fact that the sine wave... Oh, no, there is. There is four points. Is there? Oh, yes, you're right. You, um, you forced me to put six points in. Yep. Does that, does that make sense? So can, can you see how sort of uh, you could start playing around with a canopy space um, with Grasshopper using this? Yeah? When, I, when you, got, you put like the two isolated points on top of each other, yep. my question was actually can you put them side by side? Oh, okay. Um, and still like, have their own calculation and isolation for one another? Yes, you can. And that, it, you remember how I said you, you move from sort of like beginner grasshopper user to intermediate? Yeah. It's understanding that an intermediate, if, uh, how to deal with data in an intermediate way that will, would allow you to do that. Okay. It's, it's f right now, you could just bake the output of one and move it, and then you put in the second one and bake that, and then you can look at both of them. Or um, the other way is you can just copy your whole script and you can put the input of one into the first copy uh -huh. and the input of the other into the next and you just move the second one right. Okay. It's, just, it's just I can't really get uh, the way of dealing with the data across in the 50 minutes that I've got left. Cool? Sure. Uh, do you guys want to see more advanced examples or just to... Demonstrate or not? Okay, I can do I can do two things. I can do a really advanced script that uses physics that will uh, very much like Antoni Gaudi or like lava, you can start stretching things and have them react in an elastic way. Or I can do a very similar example to this, but it's controlled by an image. image. So you can go into Photoshop and you can paint uh, your results, yeah, and it will con you can control the heights of this thing using an image. Image? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I, I, don't, I didn't know how long the first section would take. I'll do the image. So the key thing is, and I'm going to use all these images, just imagine, just look at any of these images or your screens or whatever. I want you to think of just every image that we normally deal with is a rectangle. And it's, it's that because it's made of those little pixels, right? They're square and they sit in a grid. Every screen has a dimension. Every image has a dimension. But we can understand that in a different type of space. Instead of X and Y, we can think of that space as U and V. OK? So there is X, Y, Z. UVW and UVW whenever you hear it it's relating to something that isn't Cartesian to the world so for example if we use the corner of this room is the XYZ coordinate this corner over here we can I can work out where I am in this room relative to that point but whoever's working out what's on these screens they don't care what the corner of the room is and we can work relative to the screen space using U and V okay U and V is usually understood as a number between 0 and 1. So the UV coordinate of the TV at the front or the screen that's in front of you um, is that, that point here in the bottom left-hand corner we can understand as 0, 0. And the top corner is 1, 1, 1. Okay? So it doesn't matter what size it is. Can uh, anyone work out where on this screen 0 0.5, 0 0.5 would be? In the center, right? And then if I, if I just throw my point here, you, you don't have to be accurate. Can anyone have a guess at what that coordinate would be? Except for these two. You guys are quite proactive. Anyone? The first number is always U, it's, it's the horizontal, X, Y, Z, U, V, W, horizontal, vertical, out of the screen. Maybe 0 0.7, 0 0.3. Great, perfect, you understand. Does everyone understand? Yeah. Cool? So I can actually take that coordinate and, and relate it to any of these rectangular shapes, like the images that are put on the wall right now, and we can work out, okay, that point there is also that point, like, uh, 
it, it would be this point here on this image, like roughly there, yeah? So when we work with our images, you guys could work on an image in Photoshop that is very, very long and very, very sh uh, short in its height, but when we bring it into Grasshopper, it's gonna th it, think of it as a square, okay? So should I work on a really, really long image and really, really short, or do you want me to work on a square? I'll do a long image, just to demonstrate. So I'm gonna bring Photoshop up. Um, so I was talking to you guys about pixels before. Can anyone, work, can anyone give me examples of what type of information can I pull out of a color? Like? It's CMYK. So that's, yeah, that's one system. So I could say, grab this color, and uh, the, the cyan, yellow, magenta, and black values could be understood as zero to one. Like as a, a hundred, zero to 100%, that's how CMYK works. Is there any other system? Move away from thinking about uh, RGB or CMYK. What else could a color have as a property? Saturation, Saturation transparency, any others? Pardon? Brightness, so like you have its value, so it's, it's either uh, fully colorful or white or black. And then the last one would be its hue, right? So you can, there are various things that you can extract from a color. Grasshopper lets you extract anything like that from a color. I, I'm not sure if it does alpha, but what we're gonna do, I'm gonna create a small image. It doesn't have to be that high res. And I'm going to paint into this some dark elements. Jeez. Yep. So if you might do some demonstration slightly differently to the other group, yeah? Yep, we'll record both. Yeah, so then you guys can have access to both if you slightly cover in the second half something different. Yep, well if they want to do the physics one example for example. Yeah. So you. I'm just going to paint some stuff into this um, and also just to demonstrate uh, later, I'm also going to put some red in and I'll put some blue. I, I'll just make sure that's tr like a real blue. That needs to be RGB 255. Okay, so key thing is we're only going to be able to work with JPEGs or PNGs. So I'll just say this is JPEG. That means we can't do alpha. We can only get color. Is everyone familiar with that? I, I'm guessing that's a yes. So we save a JPEG, I'm going to call this map. Um, and in Grasshopper, I can use a component uh, that uh, they've, they've, they utilize to bring images in called image sampler, or image sample. We'll double click this. This brings up the image sample uh, dialog. Um, and I can select the image by going through the file path. So I'm going to go to my desktop and grab that map. And you can see it's already squished it into a square, right? And it wants to understand that between 0 and 1, 0 and 1. Cool? Okay. So without really going too deep into what these do, I'm just going to make sure I just grab brightness. So we're just going to use the black and white values of this image to begin with. Okay? So select OK. And this works very, very much like the image sampler. I mean, sorry, the graph mapper. So as I put a number into it, it looks in that system on that image for a value and it outputs the value. The key thing is you can't put a zero to a one value in. You have to put a two-dimensional number in. Uh, can, any, can anyone think, what, how would you represent a two-dimensional number? What could store 
at least two numbers in it to, to be a single object? A, a what? How about if I said three? Could you store three numbers in a single object? A point? Someone say point. A coordinate. A coordinate, yeah, or a point, right? So we can plug points into image sampler, or the image sample, and those points, it's going to ignore the Z value because there's no uh, U, uh, UVW, there's no W uh, coordinate of an image. But so for example, if I put a point in at 0.5.5, 0 .5, 0 .5, that's going to give me the center of the image. Yeah? Cool. OK, so I'm just going to use uh, my grid of points. Uh, the key thing is we need to, I just need to know, I need to convert their actual spatial information down to 0 to 1, 0 to 1, okay? I'm not going to go through that too much. Um, just the key thing is we're going to use that same system before the remap numbers. The key thing is I need to grab the bounds of the, their values. I'm going to grab the points deconstruct them into their x, y coordinates, get the bounds of their x coordinates, and convert their x coordinates to 0 to 1. And I'm going to get the bounds of the y coordinates and reconstruct them to a number between 0 and 1. And then I will reconstruct these points uh, uh, using that system. So you can see now I've got like a little small system here of, of those points between 0 and 1. Cool? These go into the image sampler. Uh, buyer be, beware. The more points you put into an image sampler, the, the more samples it has to do. If you're working on a computer that can't handle a million samples uh, in a short period of time, it's going to take a long time. Okay? So Grasshopper might seem like it crashes sometimes. What it's actually doing is it's just computing a lot of stuff. Cool? So fortunately, this is, this is small enough. If I ramp that up, the more points that I put in, it's going to go up exponentially, and it's going to slow the system down. But it, can ha it will handle it. So this outputs numbers. So if a number is between, like the first number should actually be a 1, meaning it's very bright. And we will hopefully see some lower numbers in this system, like here, which is where it's actually hitting the dark spots. Okay, so just quickly before I even throw this into three like three D space, I can actually display our points uh, with this color. So uh, hopefully that is actually understood as a color. No, it's not. Great. Okay, whatever. Um, it will do it with colors. Either way, we're going to grab a unit Z value. Just like before, we're going to move these points up based on their brightness. So that goes into unit Z, and we're going to move our original points up based on this image. So I'll just hide everything so we can see these points. And you can already see there's, there's almost like a little landscape happening there based on that image. Yeah? So I'm just going to copy the stuff that we did before that this unflattened tree style system and we'll actually create a surface from that. So we get that. So everything that's black is going to be zero, everything that is white is going to be one. Can anyone, like we've, I've used a component already to, re, to move numbers, to scale them. What could we do to make these numbers bigger? Like what if we want black to be uh, 10 and, and white to be 2 meters? Anyone? The, re, the remap? Yeah, but yeah, you're definitely in the right ballpark. Yeah, you construct the domain and we can remap. So shall we do that? So the numbers coming out of this are always between 0 and 1. So we can just construct a domain to control these values as they come out. And so I can then say, OK, uh, black could actually be 10 and white could be 3. 
and you can kind of make out that geometry uh, its relationship to, there we go. Sure. I think what, what uh, this is going to do for you is you've got to assign, like if you want to visualize data, yeah? Yep. You're going to want to visualize the brightness in three-dimensional kind of thing. So I think some of this play around would be what you want to visualize and what you want to get out of it. So if you wanted to get textures out of yep. something, then you can get that texture value and sort of see that. So again, assigning the first one is to do with the movement of people, and you could sort of loft that and sort of think of it more abstractly. Yep. So all of these things are basically visualizing in an abstract way the information. The some some. This one is more of a qualitative information. The other one was the quantitative information. That was the coordinates that you were working with. So they're very two different things that you can sort of figure out in an abstract manner to get sort of um, visualize your data. So this this image, it's it's black and white, but it, remember it's also got color in it. So if we just want to use the red values in it uh, and select red, you can see that that's now got a, a, a much different output. And if we were to go, obviously white, White's going to have a strong red, blue, and green value, while black's got nothing. Um, and then if we change that to blue, so only get the blue values, then our output's also going to be different. So we can use that image and actually start extracting things from it. Uh, the hue is going to give you a number between 0 and 100, uh, 360, because hue is a, a circular relationship. So you go red, green, blue. As you come back, you, you go purple back to red. Yeah. Um, but what what's quite cool about this is I can, let's just take this back to its brightness. I can actually go into Photoshop and make changes to my image. How do I... Um, So I'll save over the map. Uh. Depending on which computer you're using, you can actually save over it, but mine, Windows 10 doesn't seem to allow me to do this. So if I go map two, then I can swap out this image and we'll get a different result. Okay, um, so what I've done in the past is I've actually been able to, maybe if I do this, to, been able to do painting, save, if you're not using Windows 10, you should be able to save that JPEG and it'll, you'll actually see the update in Rhino. It'll try and update it automatically. Cool? Um. Uh, there's a thing. Yes? Maybe. Uh, how about if like, you painted on the screen? Can you bring a photograph and how do you bring that photograph into Rhino? What do you mean? Like if somebody took a picture of like she has... Um, uh, alleyways, yeah? Right. And somehow wanted to get information, 3D information out of that into... Right. Yeah. Okay. So that that's actually been quite a, a difficult thing for computers to do for a long time. Okay. Um, to actually be able to take a photo and like get a 3D object from it. Mm -hmm. Like if, if we could take photos and get 3D objects from them straight away, like, like already... We, could you imagine what surveys, surveyors would be doing? Uh, like they wouldn't be going in and let, like doing the points and stuff. They'd just go and take photos. Um, so there, there are techniques of being able to go take photos and actually extract that and turn it into something that's 3D. It's just you have to take lots of photos. It's called photogrammetry. 
um, and there are some there are some free tools out there that that do, do it. Um, Uh, yeah, you can you can use video um, you can use video to do photogrammetry. Uh, what it what it effectively does is uh, as you take a photo, it the system recognizes like this point because you can sort of see okay we can see the difference between the black and the brown like from my perspective, and then at this point it can see the difference between this, it can recognize it, and it works out as I move around, it can see all the various points, and it can triangulate where that is. And what it will do is actually produce a rather, depending on how many photos you take, a rough model of what you've, you've taken a photo of as a mesh. Um, so you can see this guy here, what, what people have done is they've just gone around taking photos of him in, th in a 360 degrees and it, the system's worked out roughly where each of those shadow points are. The thing is if you take photos at a different time of day, it'll, it'll ruin it. Like you've got to be really, really quick. So as the shadow moves overhead, the shadow will actually start to warp the system's understanding of, of the space because its reference points move. Yes. Um, I've I've seen it. I've seen it do. Like, hang on a moment. I've seen it do spaces. I've tried to do this. Now, now mind you, when I tried to do this, I was. I was back at uni, so this was like five years ago, um, and the software that I used wasn't the best, but things have sort of progressed from that now. So, and I haven't needed to do it ever since because I've had surveyors to do that job for me. Um, but there, uh, the, uh, have, has anyone seen app, the Apple Maps? You know uh, Apple Maps, how it's got that 3D model of of uh, the city, that's actually just, they've flown over, the, over Sydney and they've taken photos from different angles and they've used those to do photogrammetry. It's not, it's accurate to like the meter, depending on, on how far you are away and how many photos you take, but it's, clo it's close enough. So you, you know the word photogrammetry, you can, you know how to, yeah. yep. Um, the other way, the best way you can, capture space, like actual space, is with a laser survey. And none, I'm assuming none of you are going to use this because it's very expensive. Um, but effectively, a surveyor goes uh, into a site now, and instead of lining things up, working out where they are in geological space, so their longitude and latitude, and having a guy go around with a stick and going, OK, it's that rotation, it's that coordinate. They just set a machine down that shoots lasers in 360 degrees and it times how long those lasers take to get back and we get stuff like point clouds. Um, there's free software out there if you want to play with point clouds. There's a program called Recap. It's made by Autodesk. It's probably the more limited of them, but it's the user-friendly one. And then there's a program called Cloud Compare and that, that's a free program that uh, has a lot more functionality in it. Um, if you want, I can uh, send Nina some example point clouds um, so that you can play with them. But it's not obviously not going to be of uh, where, where you're doing your stuff, but it's I good think, to see. I think we have um, in the school the laser, might have laser equipment. Really? I think so. I think so. Definitely our survey, it, worth checking, we haven't used it. Yeah. I remember partly we had discussed it, whether it was ever bought or not. But the engineering survey department will definitely have it. It's, 
it's actually, it's probably one of the coolest things um, you'll see <laughs> in terms of capturing space. Because uh, not only does it, what it does is it actually takes a 360 degree photo at the same time and it associates the point with the color in that photo. So you get a color uh, point cloud of the space. But as well, when a laser hits an object, so when a laser hits concrete, there's a certain amount of light that bounces back and it records that as well. So when it hits metal, like the, this galvanized pipe, we're gonna get way more light coming back than hitting concrete or carpet. And we get these types of uh, drawings from it where it's actually showing us the, the reflectivity of the material. So uh, we use it sometimes, if we, if we just wanna extract, because the amount of points that we get from this, there might be a million points that define this pipe, we can extract that just by saying, grab us all the stuff within this reflectivity range and it will grab us that pipe. So it's actually, it's the, the main problem with this is actually reducing the information in it instead of trying to interpret information out of it. Because, uh, and don't, don't ever tell you, tell any survey I said this, but you know, a lot of surveys we get have mistakes in them. So a point cloud sort of gets rid of all of that. So what, so what would happen if you had like a film that you wanted to abstract? Right, um, well there are plugins. So Grasshopper is a plugin for Rhino and it very, it, it is the sort of vanilla, all the sort of things that you need to do very basic things. It can't deal with video, but there are plugins for Grasshopper that allow it to deal with certain things. So remember how I was talking about that physics engine? Mm -hmm. That's a plugin for Grasshopper called Kangaroo. Mm -hmm. um, the, it, it's all animal based. Um, so uh, the plugin that you would probably have to look at to try and abstract video would be Firefly. And I think there is also an article in Architecture Design on Firefly. Um, the, does anyone just like in this the next 20 minutes does anyone just want to throw like questions at me in terms of what like what your idea is and I can sort of give you an idea of where to look similar to these these two questions Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yep. So it wouldn't be an accurate 3D map, the same as a photo of your face. Yeah, it would be. It wouldn't look like a 3D version. No. But it would be some kind of like abstract expression. It would be completely abstract. And you get to decide what is abstracting it. Like you'd say, grab all the reds, and the reds point out. Or, you know, the dark parts of my face are going to stick out while the light parts are going to stick in. So it's, it's up to you. You could use the hue to define whether or not, like the thing is I've just taken points, right, and moved them up and down, yeah? But you could, you could have like almost like folies similar to like Shumi, Shumi's Parc La Villette. Um, and you can change the size of the folies based on their relationship to a space. Like this, this beam, its width and height is defined by a structural engineer, but I could define its width by how uncomfortable this space is. So there's like every element in Grasshopper is controlled by a variable, and that variable could be abstracted from anything. Yeah? So you could draw circles and change their radius based on the quality or quantity uh, element you've grabbed from that space. So you assign values to how, you know, the scale that you have developed. So like how you represent something, same way. Mosquito, that is a plugin that uh, connects Grasshopper to Twitter. So you can actually go and download Twitter uh, comments based on hashtags and it will load them into Grasshopper. I don't know what you're going to do with that. Uh, we actually, uh, we did a vivid exhibit uh, not this year, but last year, and we were trying to use that 
to control the color scheme of our vivid uh, artwork. So people would tweet at our vivid exhibit. We would take the word, look up an image on Google and extract colors from that image to control our, our uh, vivid piece. Yeah, so there's like just any, any it, it, there's everything. There's practically everything. Um, those, of, those of you who are dealing with materials, Not right now. But what are you what are you doing? He was working in that uh, was it the Hobo Hotel? What was it called? Yeah. Haber. Haber. Sorry. Um, it was just like a like an online. Do you remember Haber Hotel? Community teenager community. No? Okay. <laughs> What's Haber Hotel? It's just similar to online. Oh, like chat. Minecraft. Yeah, like chat. No. <laughs> 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 you occupy. You have like a person who sits in this. It's a chat room. It's like chat room, but you, but it's visually it's like virtual. You have an avatar. Virtual, and they like kind of the language that you can use. So it's basically like kids. It's yeah. No, I can't help you with that. <laughs> no, but can you take data from that? You can, but it's it's really okay. So for example, this this plugin called Mosquito. Mm -hmm. Someone's gone and done all the computer science involved in connecting to Twitter and downloading that Twitter information into Grasshopper Space. Okay. And the thing is, I know how to go, probably how to go to Habbo and start downloading information from it, but no one's actually gone and made that plugin yet, okay. right? So it's not as user-friendly as what Mosquito would allow. So yeah? Mosquito, you don't need to do anything, basically, you need to connect it. You just need to install it. Yeah. Whilst if you want to connect, like if you want to get Habbo to talk to Grasshopper, you need to understand how to code enough to go and extract it and like yeah, you actually need to get into the code and I, I, unless you you've done like a compu computer science degree before this okay. it probably I, uh, I'm just trying to think of each one's example sure so I think um, um, he's taken landscape and taken the silhouette sure and then different lines of that yeah yeah so what is a you know contours different uh, versions you want to you're dealing with contours in a way so yeah. Hurts. yeah you explain what you want yeah, to you're dealing with like noticeability in a landscape right um and i was looking at silhouette before but yeah it's just sort of noticeability out of an image right so just just to sort of um demonstrate i'll just use this surface as an example but there are various techniques that you can start intersecting geometries and get the results of those intersections. So a plane, a plane is something that uh, is flat and it exists in 3D space. So we can use planes to either cut uh, contours through objects or cut sections through objects. So uh, one way of doing that, let me um, drag this up here. So with this intersection, there are actually some really uh, quick tools to do contouring. So one is, is called contour. Um, so I can take this loft, uh, put, place it into the contour space, give it a point to start from. So I'm just going to use the uh, ground, uh, zero, zero point, and it's going in uh, the Z direction. Um, and we'll define a distance of, we, we don't want to do a really small number or otherwise it's going to make like millions of contours. So we'll go at least one meter to 10 meters. And I think I may have killed it because one was too small. Okay, so you can see that that started to cut through it. So I can actually hide that loft and we're now getting the, the contour lines in 3D. Now, I'm using the Z direction to do that, but I could use the Y direction. So I could cut through this geometry in Y and it will start getting uh, sections instead of contours. Yeah? yeah. Um, as, as you can see there. So I, like you can actually start analyzing the curves to see like how curve 
how much curvature there is, where there's like kinks, and that could help you decide whether or not something is noticeable or not. There's, yeah. Just basic question, how do you say in terms of like the two questions? Okay, so Rhino saves as a Rhino file, and Grasshopper, you have to save that as a Grasshopper file. And you open them at the same time? You, you open a Rhino file, and then you have to open Grasshopper, and then you have to open the Grasshopper file. The thing is, a Grasshopper file is independent to its Rhino file. So you can open a Grasshopper file with any file. So you could take your script and apply it to this person's, depending on what they've got in their you file. Can get different scripts online, you can, you can get different scripts online. I would, the thing, thing is, for a quick, easy fix, go grab them. But for learning Grasshopper, it's probably not the best thing to do, because they might not do exactly what you want. It's better to learn how to use it than rely on other people. The problem is, and this this is where I, my one of my problems with Grasshopper, there's no there's nothing to say this Grasshopper file is linked to this Rhino file. So I might open a file at work that ten people have been working on, and there'll be ten Rhino files, and there'll be five Grasshopper files, and I don't they're not they're named differently, and I don't know which one goes with which. So just when you're saving this, so for example, when I save this guy, like we, we just want to be really clear in what this does. So we'll go attractor, surface, and image sample. I would, you guys are all working by yourselves, and it's unlikely you're going to have like more than one graph superscript for this assignment. So you should be OK. I have a question. Okay. How do you, how can you turn these into um, 3D printing or laser cutting? Um, so everyone here is familiar with laser cutting. So all you need to do is just make sure that you're drawing lines in 2D on a flat plane, and then you can laser cut it. The when it comes to 3D printing, who's actually tried 3D printing? Like 10% of the room. Okay, so it gets a bit more difficult. You have to understand that 3D printers take meshes. So uh, what we're looking at right here is a curve, and what we're looking at here is a surface. Um, 3D printers have to take meshes, and the key thing is that it will not 3D print that. That is an infinitely thin object. It has no thickness to it, um, and when we make a mesh, to be 3D printed. So you have to give it the thickness. It has to be th thick, yeah. and the mesh has to be watertight, mm -hmm. which means it can't have any holes in it. Like if you imagine if you were to take that mesh and you were to put it into a bucket of water, can't have anything seeping in, right? So 3, 3D printing is a, it's an art mm -hmm. more than a science. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you guys have had failures with it. Yeah, yeah, I'm getting the, yes, I've had uh, failure. It's not your fault. It's just, it's, you're probably using cheap printers and that it's, it's an art to know what, what it's capable of doing. So the first thing I ever tried to 3D print failed. The second thing I tried to 3D print failed. I've, I've sat with a 3D printer for a week trying to get something to work and it, it just didn't work. So it's... I'm sure there's a YouTube video out there that will guide you through it because it's certainly not something that um, I'm going to be able to you explain. Have to say, in, as long as they know that they, they can go there you, and figure it out. Yes, you can use Grasshopper and Rhino to produce 3D printable objects, and I do it all the time. And uh, laser cutting. As long as you can draw a line with a program, you can laser cut. So, yes, this can laser. You can laser cut from this. I believe you have. Has everyone here used the laser cutter at, at this uni? Is there a laser cutter here? Yeah. Uh, what software do you use to print from it? Illustrator or Rhino or CAD or? Archicad. You use Archicad to print from the laser cutter. Okay. So that means the laser cutter can probably print from Rhino. Well, no, we, we just save it as a um, yeah, the file. Okay. So 
if you have some geometry in Rhino. So say, say that geometry that you made. This geometry. Yeah, so if you wanted to slice this and just cut pieces of it. Right. And then they can play around with that model. Um, that, that's going to take a bit of effort. Okay. But I can set, like if you, if, if you guys want me to show you how to make what I would call a waffle. So like you, t you can take an object and cut through it with planar elements. And as long as you put those elements, as long as you line them up, you get that 3D object out. I can, I can actually give you a script that does that. Um, that. That'll lay these out and it'll give you the, the outline to cut. It'll even slot, it'll give you the slots. So you can, instead of just doing it in one direction, you can do a, a two dimensional grid and it slots together and it's nice and strong. Uh, my, my, um, I've got uh, monitor stands at work that are made of acrylic that I've used to, I use that script to do it, so I know it works. Yep, and it, pra it can practically do any geometry. So that's a script that you can give us? Yes, I can give, I can give yeah. you that script. Not, not today, but just, yeah. yeah. I can, you can have it tomorrow. Thank you. No problem. Um, I can also, I've also got a whole bunch of scripts that do these types of attractor systems. So I, I can basically give you all of that stuff. Obviously, like, get into IDDA, look, look at, watch it. it. It's not the best course in the world. It's certainly not going to teach you how to, like, when to use what component, but it's going to teach you about each component, and it's going to make the scripts that I send far less intimidating. Like I, I hope what I've done today is, has at least made this less intimidating. Because you can imagine if I'd showed you this, if I'd said grasshopper, everyone's head would have exploded, right? Like that's already a bit scary, is it? But we can, like, you can already see that what we've, what we're doing, we're making a square grid, we're finding the distance for it. Um, I'm doing some complicated things that you just need to ignore. We're sorting, uh, we're sorting the list to get the shortest distance. We're picking the first number of that, and then we're playing around with how that distance fall off, how that falls off as as we get further away from the point. So you just have to think in a step by step logical manner, um, and if you can think that way, it's going to make emailing me with your specific question a lot easier. If if that if you could do that, yes. Um, is, have you used Dynamo? Um, I have. Is it, do you think it has the same cap capability? No. Or <laughs> yeah. Dynamo is always trying to catch up to uh, Grasshopper. It was, it was made by someone who loved Grasshopper and decided, hey, let's make this for Revit. Let's make Grasshopper for Revit. And then Autodesk sort of went, ah, Grasshopper is making McNeil a lot of money. I'm going to buy Dynamo, and that's going to be our competitor to Grasshopper. The problem is anything that gets bought by Autodesk suddenly stops developing. It just stops because they, they buy invention. They don't invent things. So it's, it's always going to be behind. But, it's, but still, even though I'm a beginner and I was using it, it still has enough capability. It, has, it definitely has capability. It's worth learning. I only use it to take whatever I do in Grasshopper and import it into Revit. Okay. Um, it is unstable and slow. That's my main problems with it. Why is it unstable? It, it crashes uh, constantly, and uh, from one update to another, your script will stop working. So you, like I might have it, for me, I'll have a script that I rely on to do a job, and then Dynamo gets updated, and suddenly the script doesn't work. And I don't have time to go in and fix that, so that's that's why. But for students, yeah, it's worth it's worth getting into. Can I ask you what, what what application does this have in your actual work, like on a real project? Me? Yeah, like this kind of this uh, stuff. stuff. So I would call what we did today complex geometry. Yeah. Um, I use complex geometry on most of my projects. Um, we use it to do roofs. We use it to do facades. We use it to do landscaping. So I've done a playground in Singapore using these techniques. And there was no roof. It was all the, the ground plane that was being morphed. Um, we use it to do bridges. Uh, we use it to do convention centers. The most important building uh, typology that uses this would be stadiums. 
Um, but then that's just complex geometry. This grasshopper is capable of um, actually doing BIM like Revit, but light and, and quick. So we've used it to cut up Wynyard Station into, into grids and then rebake that back into Revit to, um, to allow the builders to stage the sections of Wynyard Station to be built. We've, I've used it to do the uh, facade screen of the uh, Newcastle Law Court, just something like you guys should at least be aware of. So you know that tree branch screen system? That was me. Um, so that was all, that was all grasshopper modeling and, and testing and making sure that geometry was uh, capable of being molded. So it's not just being playful. We can be quite rational with, with this to, to do things. Um, the international airport, uh, the new roof there, all the steel work, the roof sheeting, and the interior surfaces were done using Grasshopper. Um, I've, I've designed a whole stadium using Grasshopper. It's, it's not limited to just this. But I think for you guys, it's just it means to, <laughs> means to learn, at least, so you guys have fun with it, and then, you know. The, th the thing is, if I asked you guys to sit down and draw a thousand lines for me right now, it would take a long time, right? This allows you to draw a thousand lines in a few seconds, okay? So if you can be clever in how you, you do use your tools, so you use a computer for what it's good at, doing things over and over again really quickly, then you, you can start to let go of those manual tasks and let the computer do that. It, it gets even more interesting when you start talking about generative design, actually getting the computer to generate uh, forms for you, and then you get to be the designer and choose which one you want. And that, that gets a bit, like if you imagine each of these variables that we plugged in was random, and we just said generate another random one, generate another random one, generate another random one, we could generate thousands of them, and then the trouble is picking which one we like best. So it's, 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 an int it's definitely the next phase of uh, where architecture is going in terms of trying to find what we can do with this. And the other one is uh, also working with the um, just abstracting information. So that was the one that I thought would be good for you guys yep. to get your data, to think about your data in other ways. So you're doing it not in a rational manner, but more in an experimental manner. So if I change this, what happens? Yeah. So if I put these values and think abstractly, and then if I change these values, what happens? Yeah. Yep. So uh, uh, when you build a model, so in some ways you're doing something similar. The, the key thing is it's quick. So you can, once you've made the script, you can play with it, right? So I don't know how long it would have taken you guys to build this manually, but you can imagine trying to like do that process over and over again as you play with it, it's quite difficult. So it allows for you to come up with systems that you can then play and sculpt with.